Okay, looks like I'm up and running. So good evening, good afternoon, hello. Nice to see all of you. Happy Mother's Day to all of you who have mothers. Um, although if you're not in the United States, you will be slightly puzzled because not every Mother's Day happens on the same day. And uh, I know for a fact from years of having split families that uh, Mother's Day is a different date in Britain, for example. Anyway, however, it is Mother's Day here in America. And uh, so I send a happy Mother's Day to all who, um, who celebrate, who are celebrating or who are whatever. Anyway, you get the general idea. So um, what else? Oh, okay, so here's the, uh, here's the skinny as I have been giving out to um, folks last night. Um, and it is um, as follows. The, um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, um, 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 sorry, I'm trying to do something else at the same time. And as usual, it's just not doing it for me. Um, anyway, um, we are going to be moving a week from tomorrow, I believe. That's when the moving van will be here and we'll be loading in the last of our stuff and all that. So I have a feeling this upcoming weekend will be crazy and therefore I am not, almost certainly not going to be reading next weekend. That said, um, and uh, you know, all, the, all of that, I, I might, it's, something might happen, things might change somehow, in which case, as always, I recommend that you check the, um, that you check the box, uh, check the uh, social media pages, especially Facebook, which is where I tend to announce these things when I'm doing them. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, I think I have possibly misinterpreted how much time the rest of the book is going to take me. So I have a sneaking suspicion I probably won't finish it tonight. Um, I had thought that I would, but now I think that I probably won't. And because of that, um, we will have to figure out when the last part will get read. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> I can't tell you. So, but that's where we're at. Um, other than that, not a huge amount to tell. Um, I have had a little spare time in the last several days, so I've spent a little time working on Navigator's Children again, which is uh, a glorious reprieve from the, uh, the horror of not working on any of my books. Um, so I'm feeling a little more reasonable. Um, still not exactly thrilled by, by life events, but you know, not complaining. Um, we've got our health, more or less. <laughs> and that's what matters, I guess. Um, and we have a place to move to, which is also good. But I'm just sitting here now looking out the windows and looking at all of the trees out there and going, I'm going to miss my trees. Ah, oh, well. Um, as I've mentioned before, we are hoping to, we're hanging on to the house, we're going to rent it to somebody, and we're hoping that we will at some point be moving back into it um, because we love this place and we, we love the quiet and we love the, the trees and the animals and all that stuff. So that's mainly what's going on. Let me think if there's anything else to tell. Um, yeah, we're just working. I'm working. Um, I'm, when I can find time, I'm thinking about either uh, Navigator's Children or The Splintered Sun, which is an upcoming novel, or because I've been reading this to you, also about the last volume of The Ordinary Farm Books, which still remains to be finished. I have a first draft, but um, Deb and I work very differently, and so the first draft is going to take um, a lot of time and energy to to make it into a finished book. And um, let me think, is there anything else? Not really, not really, no. We, we're just doing the stuff, doing the thing. So without further ado, um, I will check and see who I know has showed up, and I will try to, uh, oh, that doesn't do me any good. I will try. Try. Why does it not let me see the comments? I want to see comments. I want to see them all, and um, I don't want to see just the last few. Oh, God, but it's doing it again. I had it figured out last night, but I've now forgotten what exactly I did to do that. Um, but, you know, let's, let's check and see if I can manage it over here. And uh, yeah, okay. So 
No, but that's not going to do it. That'll just confuse things. Anyway, okay. So um, we have had several people check in already. So I will say hello to them. Although for some reason, again, tonight, we're not seeing the comments. So um, I'm not sure what exactly they had to say. They could all be just posting to say, go away, we hate you. But just in case they weren't, or uh, assuming the, the best, uh, Matthew has checked in. Matthew dangerously. Emily has checked in. Hello, Emily. Hello, Matthew. Calvin has checked in. Good to see you. Tim. Hello, Tim. Kristen. Kristen's there. Isaac is there. Good to have you, Isaac. Claudia is there. And Tracy McClatchy has showed up. Cliff, as always, and as almost always, anyway, is here, and that is a pleasure. Uh, Isabella, hello, good to see you. Barb Ann, a pleasure as always. Chris Vandal, nice to have you. Susan, you too. Christy, and yeah, that's Christy Sanders and Penny Davies. So those are the people who have checked in and left comments so far. Um, I have no idea yet how many people they're actually watching, but those are the people who have bothered to say hello. So, um, or at least to post something. As I said, it could be vicious excoriations of my person and my behavior. Doesn't matter though. Um, it's not going to change anything on this end because I can't see what people are sending. God bless it. I actually could last night and I can't figure out what combination of things I did to make that work. <sighs> this will all require a certain amount of cogitation and consideration, but until that time comes, um, I will muddle on with things as they are now. Um, why am I not getting a reading? So you guys can hear me, right? Everybody can hear me. So why am I not getting um, a reading on the thing itself? Right? Comments. Comments are there. Okay, so everybody seems to be able to hear me. Um, Matthew's checking in from Iowa. I didn't know you were in Iowa. So all of you can hear me, I guess, because this thing here says it's not broadcasting from this end. Don't know why, um, but Facebook seems to be. Well, somebody just dropped me an email and a short... Yeah, okay, good. Thank you, Christy. I appreciate it. Uh, th these things are so weird. Uh, you, normally, you have to hit go live on the streaming software, and then you have to hit go live on the Facebook software, and you do the streaming software first. The streaming software tonight will not let me click go live. It just sits there no matter how many times I click on it. Um, but the weird, and, and, and as a result, I'm not getting any of the normal stuff I get, you know, the how loud it, the microphone is or any of that stuff, despite the fact that I set it up the same way that I always do. And, but apparently, even so, it's still going on anyway, even though it technically says I have, I, I have not managed to go live. God, stuff is just nuts. Um, I remember back when I was working for Apple Computer in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Yes, a very long time ago, but yes, we had computers back then. And the main problem. I was working for what was called the Technical Information Library, which was basically um, we took the conversations and interactions with customers that the engineers had out in the Apple stores and turned them into articles to keep in the Technical Information Library, which was basically just that. It was a library of fixes and how things worked and, you know, what problems came up and how they were solved and stuff like that. And almost all of the major problems were when you tried to compile, sorry, when you tried to combine two different pieces of equipment, you know, a computer with a printer or a computer and a printer with a fax or, you know, whatever it was, even back then 30 something years ago, it was already difficult and complicated. And instead of getting less so over time, it has gotten more so to the point where I've just given up on trying to figure any of this stuff out. I just hammer at it until something breaks and then I get a new one. And uh, I'm not proud of making that, um, that, uh, that admission. Anyway, so let us go back here and start reading because I can't make sense out of anything else. Let me see if I can get my focus back. 
I have no idea why it just suddenly goes out of focus either. There we go. Who knows why? It's too weird. Okay, so. Okay. Oh, Lord. <laughs> the piece, the bookmark fell out. Okay, so what was last going on? Lucinda was out in the field outside of the greenhouse. There is something alive in the greenhouse. It is drawing creatures to it. It is drawing Gideon and Lucinda because she was exposed to it earlier toward it. And um, so Colin, uh, so Mr. Walkwell tried to go toward the greenhouse after helping um, Lucinda uh, restrain Gideon. But then he was <coughs> essentially swarmed by these fibrous things that are growing out of the greenhouse and sort of like almost like a spider's uh, webbing up its, its prey. Um, so he was helpless. Lucinda has lost her grip on Gideon. And just as she was fighting with Gideon again, Colin came out. Colin had an idea, ran back to the house, leaving Lucinda without help still. And she was furious with Colin, but she didn't know he had a plan. And his plan was that, um, to get the wire that ran from the, uh, down from the, lightning rod on top of the house and uh, splice a cord to it, a cable that they had used for some other electrical purposes, and then attach the, the other end of it to a long iron pole. And his idea was that if he could get it to the greenhouse, that the electricity from the lightning storm, because it's currently storming, it's a heavy summer thunderstorm, um, might do something. But as Colin went towards the greenhouse with this thing of his, this trailing wire and this big old iron post, um, the and, and the lightning flashing and all that, the, the thing in the greenhouse from far away still managed to send out little sprouts and things and grabbed Colin and pulled him down to the ground and then also swarmed its little fibers over his arm so he can't let go of the metal thing either. So that's where we left Colin and Lucinda. Gideon crawling toward the house, Lucinda helpless, and Colin now helpless also, and Mr. Walkwell helpless. Meanwhile, Tyler, in a uh, rather probably not well thought out attempt to um, bring back Grace from where he thinks she is, which is within the mirror world, um, the washstand mirror, um, has taken Steve with him um, because they kind of had to because Mrs. Neal was stomping through the house looking for various things and almost caught them. And um, they have found the woman they were looking for, Grace, and they are trying to get her out of the house, but they are being chased by something which Tyler has suddenly realized. Um, first, he's realized that the thing they called the Bandersnatch was some kind of weird mirror version of Gideon himself. And now they're being chased by the white lady, as Grace calls her, um, who is a mirror version of Mrs. Needle, the wretched Mrs. Needle. So that's what's going on. Um, and uh, well, anyway, so I'm just going to drop back a little bit. So she talks backward, like everything in the mirror world, uh, at least all the stuff that belongs there. As they sprinted across the hall toward the door, something big came down the stairs behind them. Something tall and stretched with long, waving arms. A twisted figure wrapped in billowing white like a misshapen bride. Twin beams of brilliant light stabbed out from the place where its eyes should have been, their glare obscuring the thing's face as its gaze raked the walls of the great hall and then fell on Tyler and Steve. Meth Isai, it cried. Nilok Mulob Hutin! Or Huthni. Tyler could only pray as he slammed through the doorway that they wouldn't have to meet the mirror of Colin, too. They ran and ran. For a while, they could hear the mirror needle clumping along behind them, and then could only make out the steam whistle shriek of her voice. Finally, they got beyond even that. Tyler now all but shut his eyes, relying on his sense not of where they should be, but of where the mirror was a sensation like a warm glow at the edge of his thoughts. 
It seemed as if they had been running for half an hour when they found themselves getting near the nectic again. Of course, of course, he had stupidly forgotten that the washstand mirror was in a different place, in the mirror version of Mrs. Needle's office. Did that mean they were entering the mirror needle's territory again? He shuddered, but realized that maybe they had done themselves a favor, leading her away from her office. At last, he reached a door that felt right. Tyler swallowed deep as he turned the knob, but when he saw that it was indeed the mirror office, he gasped in relief. He dragged Steve and the white-haired woman through, then slammed the door and grabbed the handle tightly. The mirror was still waiting, all alone in a pool of faint, dreary light. Go, Tyler said. Help her through, Steve. I'm going to hold the door just in case. Steve Carrillo guided the exhausted Grace through the frame of the mirror and pushed her through the reflection, then clambered wearily up onto the mirror washstand itself. Jenkins, he said, I gotta tell you something. I know, said Tyler as he pulled himself up beside him. He could hear something moving in the hallway just outside and the angry murmur of backward speech. I know, never again. And I totally agree. As the knob began to turn on the office door, they plunged through the unsolid glass, Steve first, then Tyler right behind him. Chapter 40, Carrot Girl, Not Nice. Lucinda didn't even know why she was still trying to hang on to Gideon. She was out of strength while he, deranged by the call of the greenhouse thing, was still fighting as hard as ever. Colin Needle had tried to help, but had failed completely, and instead put himself in deadly danger. Even Mr. Walkwell had succumbed to the thing. Ragnar, the only person left who might conceivably help, was on the other side of the farm. It was hopeless. Yes, surrender, a voice urged her, although not in words. The words were all Lucinda's, as if she was talking to herself a soothing, reasonable version of her own inner voice. Come here, join, become. An impression of completeness beckoned to, beckoned to her, a promise of joy in belonging, so powerful it wasn't even an emotion, but a state of being, so wonderful that words couldn't even describe it. Come, become us. Carrot girl, help. Scared? The new voice in her thoughts, that of young Desta, startled her back to herself. She realized she had almost lost her grip on her great uncle and she grabbed his muddy bathrobe tighter. Desta? Desta, can you hear me? But Lucinda's thoughts seemed to drift up and be snatched away as if by the wind. Nothing came back to her. Another lightning flash made the rain seem to hang in midair. Shiny white strands of the monster fungus were rising all around the greenhouse, bursting through the soil and reaching toward the sky as if worshiping the storm. And even as these hundreds of strands twined upward, the main fungus body was growing larger by the moment, swelling like rising dough, pressing against the dirty greenhouse windows. Panes of glass began to burst out of their frames, shattering with sounds loud enough for Lucinda to hear them even above the rising winds. Carrot girl! The dragon's thoughts were growing fainter. Help! Scared! Bad animals! The reptile barn! Mr. Walkwell said the manticores were loose in the reptile barn. Remembering was like another painful blow. Poor Desta! She did her best to push all the other thoughts away. Struggling, deranged Uncle Gideon in her arms, that thing like a pile of rotted marshmallows swelling and oozing out of the collapsing greenhouse, and helpless Mr. Walkwell and Colin Needle. Oh, God, Colin, he's trapped holding that piece of metal and there's lightning everywhere. And against all that painful clamor in her thoughts, she turned her mind back to the young dragon. Desta, it was so terribly hard to concentrate. Desta, can you hear me? I'm here, here. 
She thought she felt a momentary touch of the dragon's thoughts, like a burst of radio music through a roll of static. Desta? Carrot girl. And with the faint call came a sort of vision, as if she was seeing what the dragon saw, shapes scuttling across the floor of the reptile barn, the weird barking noises the manticores made as they hunted. But there was something strange about it, too. If she was truly seeing what Desta saw, the young dragon seemed to be looking down on the scene from above, perhaps perched on one of the catwalks near the roof of the vast structure. What are you doing up there? Desta's wings had barely been strong enough to lift herself off the ground when Lucinda and Tyler had been banished. Did you fly up there? Yes. Yellow man, let me out. That must be Ragnar because of his white shot golden hair. Smart, Lucinda thought. Gives her a better chance of staying safe. The manticores can't fly. And then something else occurred to her. Is Yellow Man still there? she asked. Yelling, running with stick, fighting bad animals. For all his strength and bravery, the Norseman hadn't been able to beat one manticore at the gate. What could he do against several? And are there other people with him? Turn face and, and hat men. That would be Haneb and the three amigos. Desta was always trying to steal the herdsmen's fur-lined hats. She hoped the farm workers would be able to hold off the manticores on their own because she needed Ragnar. Bring yellow man to me, she told the dragon. What came back was confusion. Bring him to me, Desta. You have to bring him to me. It's important. No, bad animals hurt Desta. No! The fear and the mess of jumbled ideas was very real. The young dragon was terrified of the manticores. You have to. I need you. Carrot girl needs you. No! It was the panicky, absolute refusal of a child. No! In the rainy garden across the farm, Lucinda wrapped her arms tighter around Gideon's skinny chest as she did her best to fall into the dark, calm place where she could not just speak to the dragon, but feel her and be felt by her. You have to. Desta, I need you. If you don't, I won't give you carrots anymore. But no bribe or even threat was going to coax Desta down from her perch in the rafters of the reptile barn. Lucinda realized she would have to do on purpose what she had done by accident the day when Desta tried to steal the bracelet. Desta, she warned, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to make you. No! The young animal was beyond reason. Lucinda reached out until she could feel Desta's thoughts, feel Desta whole. She applied pressure to those thoughts, imagining as carefully and thoroughly as she could what it would feel like for Desta to jump down. At first, she did her best to make it seem that it would be feel good to do what Lucinda wanted, but the dragon was either too frightened or somehow, despite her age, too strong to be manipulated by kindness. A cold, miserable feeling settled over Lucinda, a feeling of pure need. I'm, I'm so sorry, she thought, then reached out and squeezed Desta's thoughts hard. No! hurts. Horrible. It was just horrible. Lucinda had never done anything that made her feel worse. It was using sharp spurs on a horse that was already doing its best, like spanking a child who didn't know what she had done wrong. Even in the midst of all the other crazy, overwhelming sensations, what she was doing made her feel sick, but there was no other way to save Gideon, Mr. Walkwell, and Colin. Time had run out. Let go! It was a silent but agonized shriek of pain and betrayal. Carrot girl, bad! Pushing and squeezing at the dragon's most sensitive feelings, Lucinda did her best to concentrate, to ignore the sense of betrayal flowing back to her along their connection like poisoned air, 
as she forced Desta to spread her wings and leap down from the rafters, then clung to the dragon's thoughts as the creature flapped in an awkward spiral and hit the upper floor landing with a painfully hard thump. Desta's misery was a throbbing ache in Lucinda's own heart, but she couldn't afford to let go. Now get Ragnar. Get Yellow Man. Bring him up. Bring him to me. Pick him up. Bring him. Desta's resistance had become as thoughtless as that of any wounded animal, but no matter what the dragon did, she couldn't free herself from Lucinda's control. Desta climbed onto the railing and then sprang out into the air to glide on trembling wings across the upper part of the barn. One of the three amigos looked up and shouted a warning, but Desta abruptly dropped down and caught Ragnar by the shoulders of his thick white overalls, then lifted him several feet in the air and glided toward the open front door of the reptile barn. The young dragon had the wingspan of a small plane, but it was still hard for her to lift the Norseman. Lucinda felt the big man fighting back, fighting hard, and within a few yards of escaping the barn, Desta had to drop him. Get him! Again! Lucinda couldn't afford to think about what she was doing, about the pain she was causing Ragnar and this beautiful, one-of-a-kind animal. Grab him! Bring him to me! The Norseman turned to hurry back into the barn, but Desta caught him from behind, grabbing him by the reinforced collar of his safety suit, then beat her wings so hard that within only seconds she had lifted him a hundred feet in the air, where Ragnar recognized the futility of further resistance. He stopped struggling and even reached up to grab the dragon's legs and take some of the weight off the claws that must be digging painfully into his body through the heavy canvas. I'm sorry, Ragnar, Lucinda thought, but of course he could not hear her thoughts as the dragon could. Now she just wanted the nightmare to end, one way or another. I'm sorry, Desta, I'm so sorry. A painful, hard thump against her forehead brought her attention back to the reality of the garden and the storm. Desta and Ragnar suddenly disappeared from her mind's eye. Her great-uncle Gideon was trying to push away from her, <clears throat> his mouth opening and closing with a clack of teeth as though he was trying to say something, but his eyes were as empty as a department store mannequin's. One of his flailing hands struck her on the jaw so hard it felt like a tooth came loose. Then he was dragging her through the mud in the chaos of thunder and lightning flash. Something dropped from the sky beside her and landed in an awkward jumble of wings and arms and legs and raspy protest. Ragnar rolled out of the thrash of dragon limbs and stood up, ready to defend himself if, if Desta attacked again. The young dragon's snaky head whipped from side to side, hissing. When she saw Lucinda, she backed up in alarm, as if unable to reconcile the carrot girl before her on the ground and the cruel mistress in her head who had forced her to come here. For half a moment, Lucinda could feel the animal's rage so strongly beating out at her like the heat from an open oven that she thought Desta might simply bound across the ground between them and snap her head off. Carrot girl! The thoughts bombarded her, slapped at her, the dragon equivalent of shouting, Carrot girl, bad! Hurt us! Desta leaped into the air with a loud slap and thrash of wings and flew off over the top of the farmhouse. For a single lightning-painted instant, she reappeared further along the sky, then vanished again. Ragnar stumbled toward Lucinda and dropped to his knees, then grabbed Gideon in his strong arms and imprisoned him. The master of the farm continued to resist, but with no more luck now than a babe in arms. What happened? The Norseman demanded in a voice made hoarse by shouting. Did you send that vermling after me? We're in trouble. She quickly told him as much of the story as she could. <coughs> you have to help Colin. Help Mr. Walkwell. The Viking looked at the greenhouse and made a face. Baldur's blood, that is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. He turned back to Lucinda. Master Needle had a good idea for once. Set the cursed vegetable on fire. 
What? In the midst of her struggle with Gideon, she hadn't even grasped exactly what Colin had been planning. Now, as if thinking had awakened his resolve, the old man began squirming once more in Ragnar's arms. I ask your pardon, the Norseman said. What? Lucinda was so exhausted that nothing made sense. Why? Not yours, child. He lifted a fist big as a beef roast and struck Gideon sharply on the back of the head. The old man slumped and lay still. Now I go to get what I need to kill this demon, he said and loped off toward the farmhouse. Don't fear, he shouted over his shoulder. I will come straight back. Rain swirled, blown almost horizontal by the wind. Freed from Gideon, Lucinda crawled across the wet ground to Colin, who had long since stopped struggling and lay silent and still in his net of fungal threads. She pulled at the aluminum fence post in his hand, but although she could break any single one of the little white fungus threads easily, each time she did, several crept back in to take its place, and she could not break them in bunches. Lightning leaped down from the sky only half a mile away, making a dazzle on top of a nearby hill, and even as she watched, the shrieking wind was rolling more black clouds toward them like a steamroller. Colin opened bleary eyes. Don't, don't let me die, he begged her. Please don't let me die. I'm sorry I took it. I'm sorry. She had no idea what he was sorry about, nor did she care. I'm trying to help you. Her wet fingers kept slipping off the strands. Oh, God, I'm trying, Colin. Stand away, girl. Ragnar came crashing back through the garden toward them, something heavy swinging in each hand. He set down the two large cider jars and wrenched the aluminum post out of the boy's hand, shredding hundreds of fungal threads with a horrid ripping and popping noise as Colin let out a screech of agony. Ragnar straightened up took a quick couple of steps and flung the metal post toward the greenhouse. It wobbled through the air, trailing its wire like a giant threaded needle, but was pushed sideways by the powerful wind and fell to earth several yards short of the wall of dead and dying creatures that had piled up at the greenhouse's base. God's curse it! The Norseman turned to Lucinda. I must go closer but then the demon will be able to reach me as it caught Simos, unless I can set it burning. That will give me a few moments, I think. He lifted and uncorked first one of the gallon jars, then the other. The smell of gasoline blew past her on the wind. Ignoring another cry of pain from Colin, Ragnar tore the sleeve off the boy's wet shirt and crammed it into the mouth of the jar. He did the same thing with the other sleeve, prompting a weaker cry of pain and protest. Colin looked as if he had all but fainted. Do you have fire? Ragnar asked Lucinda. Or any way to make it? She stared at him for a long, confused moment, then shook her head. She searched Colin's pockets. He was in so much pain he scarcely seemed to notice. He doesn't either, she said. He smiled a grim smile. Then I have no choice but to try to wade through those griping demon fingers. If Simos could not do it, then I cannot either, but I must try. He reached out and patted her cheek with his gasoline, with his gasoline stinking hand. I ask for your pardon, Lucinda. She flinched. Are you going to hit me? Ragnar shook his head. I ask pardon because I cannot sing my death song well in your tongue. Lucinda Jenkins. Still it must be sung, so it can be heard by those who listen, and they say the gods understand all tongues. He set the jugs down beside her and trotted through the rain toward the greenhouse. This will be the second time I have sung it, he shouted over his shoulder. Let us hope that again it will be in vain. Lucinda didn't know what he meant. The monstrous thing inside the ancient greenhouse had long since forced out all the windows and was oozing out of every opening in the corroded metal cage, its uppermost extensions stretching 30 feet or more into the air and branching into hundreds of shapes as weird and alien as snowflakes. 
As the Viking approached, the starry profusion of shapes shuddered, and the entire bulk of the fungus began to swell and rock. The Norseman's voice rose, each word loud and heavy as a great stone. It gladdens me to know that Odin sets out the benches for a banquet, he sang, or rather chanted in a deep, booming voice. Soon we shall be drinking ale from cups of horn. A hero who is ushered into Odin's hall does not lament his death. And Ragnar Leathershanks shall not enter Old One-Eye's hall with words of fear upon his lips. Shiny white strands began to climb the tall Viking's legs, more and more of them coiling around him until he staggered to a halt several dozen yards from the greenhouse, not far from the motionless cocoon shape of Mr. Walkwell. I have fought against many foes in many battles, he sang, louder now to, the, to best the mounting thunder. My sons are gone, and their sons after them. I myself brought an ending to many men, and now I am a king out of his time. But I never imagined pale serpents like these would be the ending of my life. Ragnar bent and ripped away as many of the strands as he could, then forced himself a few steps forward, tearing the pale root-like strings out of the earth as he went, snapping dozens of them with each stride. He took a step. He took another step. Against all odds, he was still moving toward the thing, but each step was slower and more labored than the last. Colin raised his head, clutching his arm against his belly as he spoke through chattering teeth. Is he... is he getting close to it? Lucinda watched a moment longer and then shut her eyes in despair. Rain, warm as blood, ran down her face. No, it got him. It's, it's tangling him up like Mr. Walkwell. It's my fault, Colin said. I should, I should have told you that there was something weird in the greenhouse. Lucinda! It was a new voice. Lucinda, where are you? She opened her eyes. Here, Tyler, over here. Something was crashing toward her through the garden rose like a charging elephant. A moment later, her brother tumbled onto the muddy ground beside her. Lucinda, what's going on? And what's that? He stared at the horrible white thing swelling from the greenhouse like rising dough. This is crazy. Even as she tried to form the words to explain, Steve Carrillo came staggering up behind him. Steve doubled over, gasping for breath, and lifted a hand in a shaky sort of wave. Hi, Lucinda. You're too late, Jenkins, said Colin bitterly. You and your dumb friend, we've already lost. Ragnar said we needed to burn that thing. Lucinda spoke quickly before the boys started to fight again. There's a pole with a wire on it over there attached to the lightning rod. That was Colin's idea, but Ragnar couldn't throw it close enough. Then Ragnar made some gasoline bombs, but we didn't have anything to light them with. For a moment, she felt a sudden twinge of hope, foolish as it was. Do you have something? Matches? Tyler thought hard. His face twisted in worry, then shook his head. Sorry, Luce. She felt as though she was about to dissolve, as if the rain had been beating down on her for so long she was about to become water herself and flow away. Oh, Tyler, where were you? How could you run off like that? There were guns, and the manticores are loose. I, and I think that thing is going to reproduce. She pointed to the impossible shape growing out of the greenhouse. The strange tentacle-like things extended from the main body like tiny chimneys, hundreds and hundreds of them, each one ending in strands that waved in the wind like seaweed. That's what it does. But if it puts out spores with all this wind and rain, it's going to take over everything. Hey, I have a lighter, said Steve Carrillo. What? Lucinda and Tyler both shouted it at the same time, so loud that Steve shied back. Sure, 
he said, looking a little shamefaced. I, I, I borrowed it from my uncle? You can't make a fire on a night like this without a lighter or some matches, and I wanted to make some mores. Heck, I thought we were going camping. He had scarcely produced it from his jacket before Tyler snatched it away, pulled the cider jars close, and applied the flame first to one of Colin's torn-off sleeves, then to the other. The fabric was wet, but gasoline had soaked up into it from the jar, and after just a few seconds, both wicks caught and burned with a blue-yellow flame. Lucinda cowered away, fearing that they might blow up any second. Don't worry, that's, that's not how these things work, Tyler said. At least I don't think so. Steve, you grab that one. Me? No, the other Steve. Look, my sister can barely sit up, and Needle looks like his arm's broken. Come on, dude, hero time. But although he spoke bravely, her brother looked pale and frightened, his lips almost blue in the weird storm light. Don't do it. Lucinda told him. It already got Ragnar and, and Mr. Walkwell. Tyler only shook his head. He stood up, holding one jug away from his face. After a moment, so did Steve Carrillo. If we live through this, Steve said, I'll need to use your phone to call home. My folks are probably really pissed. And then he and Tyler went loping down the rainy garden rows, slowed by the weight of the heavy jugs. Lift your feet, Lucinda heard Tyler yell. Don't let those white things get a grip on you. Lightning flashed so bright that for a long moment, everything before Lucinda's eyes went black, even as the thunder made her very bone shudder. Then she dimly saw the lights of the two jugs bobbing near where Ragnar had stopped. You're too close, she screamed, but Tyler was also shouting. Throw it high, dude, her brother called to Steve. They have to break. And he swung his own by the ring at the neck, spinning himself and the jar round and round like an Olympic hammer thrower, then let it go. It flew up and then plopped down into the mud without breaking, a foot short of the pile of dead animals clustered against the greenhouse's iron structure. The flame was still burning, though it guttered in the rain, and as gasoline spilled out of the jar, it made a growing but unimpressive pool of blue fire. No, Tyler shouted in despair. Steve, you have to do it. You have to hit the greenhouse. Stephen Carrillo stared for a moment as another lightning flash turned the entire garden into a kind of stage set, rows and rows of flat pictures each set in front of the next, Garden plants, the greenhouse itself, mountains, and sky. Then he bent down. For a moment, Lucinda thought he was going to set the cider jar down and simply walk away in defeat, but he was bending for balance. He spun, surprisingly nimble, holding the jug in both hands, and then let it go. It flew end over end, flaming wick rotating like a Catherine wheel, its arc not as high as Tyler's, but a little longer. Lucinda's heart rose. It was going to reach the greenhouse. It thumped against the upper, uppermost part of the structure without breaking, the impact deadened by the pale, doughy blobs growing out of the frame. For an instant, it teetered there, and it seemed the monstrous thing would simply draw in the jug itself like a sea anemone snatching a fish, but it was too heavy and too delicately balanced. It fell away, rolled down the mound of dead creatures at the base, and smashed into the other jug, breaking them both. Flames spattered up the sides of the greenhouse and the pale, doughy flesh where it had oozed through the broken panes. More fire spread across the ground. The white tentacles spasmed in shock and what could only be pain. The greenhouse thing's screaming thoughts, if anything so primitive could be called that, ripped through Lucinda, knocking her flat on the ground and leaving her dizzy, unable to make her arms or legs work. It was the worst thing she'd ever felt in her head, a convulsion of fiery agony that seized her and shook her like the jaws of some great beast. When the worst had passed, she could only lie still for long moments with rain splashing her face, until finally she found the strength to drag herself upright again, 
although the fungus monster's sensations of alarm and pain still battered her. Hang on, I'm still here. Still battered her. Where was I? Okay, the part of the white thing that wasn't on fire was stretching even farther into the sky now, mouth-like holes gaping in the pale, spongy mass as if a thousand voices screamed at once, but all Lucinda could hear above the storm was the whistle of escaping gases. In its pain, the creature had lost control of much of its network of threads, and Ragnar was busily tearing himself loose. As soon as he could move his legs again, he staggered over to Mr. Walkwell and yanked him free, but the farm's overseer did not move, and Ragnar had to carry him away from the burning greenhouse. Simos Walkwell, who could lift the farm wagon with one hand, looked as shrunken and lifeless as a withered turnip, but at least he was free. Beside Lucinda, the fungal strands fell away from Colin Needle and withdrew into the ground. But suddenly, just when it had seemed they had destroyed their terrible enemy, the mass of the main fungus body began to split open above the places where fire was blackening its flesh. A transparent ooze began to flow from these cracks, extinguishing the flames that had been scorching the thing's surface. The echo of its power still pulsed in Lucinda's head, its single-minded need to spawn, its mindless determination to spread itself to the winds. The thing was not beaten. Lightning flashed again. Everybody, back, Ragnar shouted. Quickly! He bent and picked up the fence post from where it had fallen short and advanced toward the greenhouse like a knight marching into a dragon's cave. Lucinda could barely hear him over the thunder and a bizarre whistling noise that was coming now from the thing, but she did as he had said, pulling Colin by his good arm until the boy finally managed to crawl on his own. She turned to look for Tyler and Steve hurrying after her and saw something behind them she would never forget, although she would wish for the rest of her life that she could. The charred white and black mass was stretching wider now, its strands quivering with the spores they were about to release with, sorry, let me read that again. The charred white and black mass was stretching wider now, its strands quivering with the spores they were about to release. But the truly horrible thing was that for a moment, she could see something of Gideon's own face and shape forming itself out of the main body's moving white surface as if the fungus had tasted her great uncle so deeply and so long that it wanted to be him. A blinding flash of light whitewashed the sky. Ragnar threw the fence post spear again, and this time it shivered through the air and thumped into the thickest part of the monstrous fungus, the wire trailing like a row of silver sparks. Thunder boomed and boomed again very close, then the sky exploded in a monstrous flash, so powerful that the ground lurched, knocking her off her feet again. Blue fire crackled and arched where the fence posts stuck out of the ground, and white strands curled into blackened threads all around the ruined greenhouse. The body of the thing, a grotesque and unstable copy of Gideon, swelled and began to grow bigger. For a mad moment, Lucinda thought it might pull itself out of the greenhouse wreckage and walk, but then it burst into gouts of dripping fire. The monstrous Gideon face twisted in agony or fury, then fell back into bubbly nothingness. Spores poured out but caught fire and disappeared in clouds of burning sparks, popping in the air, vanishing like the falling fireworks at a Fourth of July show. Inky black smoke curled from the melting wreckage and was swept away by the wind. Lucinda felt a hand on her arm, then one on the other side. It was Tyler and Steve Carrillo lifting her out of the mud. We're alive, was all she could say. Alive. Tyler nodded, shook his head, then nodded again. Yeah, he said. We're alive. Don't worry about me, she told him. You guys have to carry Gideon. Ragnar knocked him out, but that thing had him really bad. 
with the boys awkwardly cradling the unconscious Gideon, they all turned their backs on the smoldering greenhouse and began to make their way across the garden toward the house. Colin was staggering along under his own power, holding his arm against his chest. Lucinda moved up to offer him some support, but he turned away from her and continued to make his own slow way. Ragnar was carrying Mr. Walkwell. The sight of the old man's closed eyes and limp form frightened her. Is he all right, Ragnar? He's not. Simos is alive, the big man told her. He didn't look as though he could claim much more himself, but he is in a bad way. We won, didn't we? She asked, but she said it quietly, mostly to herself. Oh, one thing, Luce, Tyler said from behind her, grunting a little as he tried to balance his share of their great uncle. If you were going to go and lie down, there's, there's kind of someone sleeping in your room. She turned to look back. Tyler had a funny expression on his face, a little nervous, but also quite proud. You remember Grace, Gideon's wife? Lucinda had no idea what he was talking about and was so battered and exhausted that she didn't think she could string two more words together, so she opted for just one. Whatever. And that's the end of that chapter. So let me see, chapter 41, chapter 42, chapter 43. Actually, no, it looks like I've got enough chapters left to do a couple more nights. So maybe, even though it's early, I should just wrap it up there. And then when I come back in my new locale, I can... Why is my chair... My little pneumatic chair thing, my little lifty thing that you set, um, it leaks, <laughs> I guess. Maybe it's just me getting shorter with age, but no, it leaks. I could actually feel it going, me going slowly down as I'm reading. Um, anyway, so I think, yeah, it's only seven minutes left. So rather, than, it's, there's way too much to read tonight. I was completely wrong. I, mis, I misinterpreted. It's very hard to tell how long these things take. Um, so I will finish the book off probably in the weekend after I come back. Um, until that time, as I've mentioned several times, but I will mention one more time for clarity's sake, because that's the kind of over-explaining dude I am. Um, I will not, almost certainly not going to, going to be reading next weekend, um, because of moving and things like that. Um, stay tuned, check in if you're interested, check in with me on Facebook. And if for some reason that changes, which, you know, maybe we can't get the moving van and so we're put off another week or something, but as of now, that's what's scheduled. Um, but if something changes, I will let people know. So it never hurts to look. Um, anyway, what else? Yeah, that's basically it. So again, I'll be off for at least a week. It may be more than that. I don't know what's going to happen till I actually get to the new house and, you know, it's it's not a new house to me. It's the house I grew up in. But until I, I've never tried to do any broadcasts from it or anything like that or anything complicated at all. So until I get there and start setting things up and check out the quality of the, the, the Wi-Fi signal and stuff like that, I don't really know um, what's going to happen. So, so that's where I'm at. That's what's happening. And um, so do not expect me next week and possibly not the week after but I will keep people posted as to what was going on and what is going on and what will continue to go on which will be madness and savagery as always um, but until then uh, I would like to thank you for joining me I'm gonna check out a few minutes early um, happy Mother's Day to all those who have mothers out there and are interested in celebrating and commemorating um, and I think that's basically it. So thank you for joining me. Pleasure as always. Be good to yourselves. Be good to your friends and loved ones. I will be talking with you very soon. Thank you for the kind wishes on the move. It definitely helps, especially when it's a move I did not want to have to make. And it has, you know, had knock-on effects, which have interfered with a lot of other stuff we were trying to do. So I appreciate the kindness, and it helps. It does help. So anyway... 
peace, be well, and I will talk to you all very soon, one way or the other. Thanks.